Friedrich Nietzsche's Apollo or Dionysus from Friedrich Nietzsche, The Dionysian Spirit of the Age by Alfred Richard Orridge, 1873-1934, published in 1906. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Apollo or Dionysus Aphorisms The existence of the world can be justified only as an ascetic phenomenon. Spirit is that life which itself cutteth into life. The secret of a joyful life is to live dangerously. Life is whatever must surpass itself. Two things are wanted by the true man, danger and play. How is freedom measured? By the resistance which has to be overcome, by the effort which it costs to retain superiority. Throw not away the hero in thy soul. Ye are permitted to have enemies who must be hated, not enemies whom ye can despise. Become what thou art. Tragedy. The dream world of a Dionysian ecstasy. Everything that suffereth wanteth to live in order to become ripe and gay and longing. Men must require strength, otherwise they never attain it. A good war halloweth every cause. Apollo or Dionysus Whoever wishes to understand Greek culture, said Nietzsche, must first penetrate the mystery of Dionysus. The statement is equally true if we substitute for Greek culture Nietzsche himself. The secret of Nietzsche is the secret of Dionysus. It was through the gateway of Greek tragic art that Nietzsche found his way into his own world, and all his originality and daring, as well as his excesses and contradictions, become intelligible when once this tragic view is seized. In his study of Greek art, Nietzsche was struck by a fact which had puzzled many thinkers before him. Why did the Greeks, the blithest and best constituted race the world has ever seen, need such a tragic art as theirs? For they were not emotionally asleep, nor was it as a medicinal purgation of soul that they suffered tragedy. On the contrary, they were a highly impressionable, profoundly ascetic people and the evidence shows them deeply moved, yet greatly rejoicing, in the tragic drama. Yet what need had they of tragedy? It is plain from the form of the question that Nietzsche's conception of art was not the ordinary conception. The art of a people was not to be accounted for by their whims and fancies, it was to be determined by need. What does not spring from necessity is not art. Unless the people need art as they need bread, how can their art be great? But to satisfy what imperious need did the Greeks create tragedy? Nietzsche found the solution of the problem in the myth of Apollo and Dionysus, and the antithesis he there discovered he afterwards employed in art, literature, philosophy, morality, and life itself. Mythology, he saw, was no less than the spiritual history of a people, the records of its moods, its periods of spiritual doubt, despair, and triumph. In the story of the coming of Dionysus into Greece, of the resistance of Apollo, and of the final reconciliation, Nietzsche saw the outlines of spiritual movements mythically veiled the phases of the myth corresponding to historic phases of the Greek mind. The coming of Dionysus was a popular movement of ideas. The resistance of Apollo was a popular movement of conservatism. The reconciliation was a compromise. Regarded in this way, the myth becomes history of the most intimate nature and records the history of the Greek soul during several centuries. All the more interesting is the story to us on account of the essential similarity between ancient Greece and modern Europe. 
the issues involved in the struggle of apollo and dionysus are the same now as then in truth as nietzsche discovered the way to the modern world is through the portals of the ancient wisdom the spiritual condition of greece during the period immediately preceding the dionysian awakening was comparable to the spiritual condition of europe during the eighteenth century greece was a pollen in the sense that europe was religious the long-established apollon cult was fast becoming a convention now that the titans the elemental forces of wild nature were vanquished and the gods had no more enemies olympus the bright and splendid olympus began visibly to fade great zeus himself was nodding on his throne religion morality art life itself were losing their hold on men and greece was threatened with the fate of india then it was that there came into greece from the north the home of spiritual impulse a new power in the form of dionysus that its leader was a thracian that he brought with him the secret of wine music and ecstasy that he was instantly welcomed by women and that the movement so inaugurated began rapidly to spread over greece all this is clear enough even in the secular story but the spiritual issues were infinitely greater for dionysus and the dionysian spirit were everywhere in open and direct antagonism with everything apollon the whole structure of the greek mind under apollon influence was threatened at every point by the attacks of the dionysians its modes of thought its religion its morality its art its philosophy its very existence were challenged in comparison with all that greece had so far been the dionysian movement was revolutionary irreligious immoral barbaric and anarchic the reception of such a movement by the apollon greeks may easily be conceived by modern europeans however they might secretly feel the attraction of the splendid virility of the new movement they could not but pause before accepting doctrines which flew in the face of accepted established customs it was true that the established customs were stale that olympus was fading that greece was dying but the admission of dionysus with his train of ecstatic women wild men and still wilder doctrines seemed a remedy worse than the disease placed once more in a position of necessity apollo girded himself for the fight and the conservative forces for a while succeeded in repelling the dionysian invaders thus by a curious reaction the very element that threatened to destroy served in fact to strengthen and renew but such an effect did not pass unnoticed among the greeks it would be absurd to suppose that many individual greeks were clearly aware of the problems they were facing spiritual movements are conscious in the minds of only a few but they have their home in the mind of the race the question that now presented itself was this remembering olympus at war with titans olympus at rest and dying of rest and olympus renewing its youth in war with dionysus was it possible was it really true that olympus needed an enemy that conflict was indispensable to olympus sworn deadly enemy of apollo as dionysus might be could apollo really live without him might not dionysus the eternal foe be also the eternal saviour of apollo the question was afterwards put by nietzsche in myriads of forms the whole of his work may be said indeed to be no less than the raising of this terrible interrogation mark he divined and stated the problem for modern europe as it had been stated for ancient greece he asked europe the question which greece had already asked herself and which greece had magnificently answered for the answer of greece is recorded in her tragic mysteries in greek drama the answer of the greek mind to the momentous question is a splendid affirmative not apollo alone not dionysus alone but apollo and dionysus 
what will be europe's reply before however considering any further the meaning of greek tragedy it is advisable to glance briefly at the issues involved in the eternal antagonism while in their human aspects apollo and dionysus may stand respectively for law and liberty duty and love custom and change science and intuition art and inspiration in their larger aspects they are symbols of oppositions that penetrate the very stuff of consciousness and life they are its warp and woof thus apollo stands for form as against dionysus for life for matter as against energy for the human as against the superhuman apollo is always on the side of the formed the definite the restrained the rational but dionysus is the power that destroys forms that leads the definite into the infinite the unrestrained the tumultuous and passionate in perhaps their profoundest antithesis dionysus is pure energy which blake a thorough dionysian said was eternal delight while apollo is pure form seeking ever to veil and blind pure energy life as it thus appears to the eye of the imaginative mind is the spectacle of the eternal play and conflict of two mutually opposing principles dionysius ever escaping from the forms that apollo is ever creating for him and it is just this unceasing conflict that is the essence of life itself life is conflict dionysus without apollo would be unmanifest pure energy apollo without dionysus would be dead inert each is necessary to the other but in active opposition for as stage by stage the play proceeds apollo must build continually more beautiful more enduring forms which dionysus in turn must continually surmount and transcend the drama of life is thus a perpetual movement towards a climax that never comes apollo never will imprison dionysus forever dionysus never will escape forever from apollo only as in the early stages of life dionysus begins by speaking in the language of apollo apollo will in the later phases learn more and more to speak in the language of dionysus life itself will become dionysian as the eternal conflict proceeds in the greek drama nietzsche as has been said found at once the problem and its solution for what could life have meant to the spectators of the plays of aeschylus and sophocles what but the tragedy of the eternal strife the recognition of the essential tragedy of life itself the spectacle of a never-ending world drama in which the gods played for the tragic greeks life was the dionysian will to renew at war with the apollon will to preserve life was intelligible only as an ascetic spectacle there was no finality no purpose no end no goal only the gods played ceaselessly and the business of man was to assist at the spectacle and in the play as a joyous spectator actor he could enter into the strife consciously aiding the unfolding of the eternal drama of which he himself was both dionysus and apollo for as the world drama is in truth the drama of mind so the interior nature of the individual is the stage on which it is played the perception of this truth by the greeks was the signal of the reconciliation of apollo and dionysus as at delphi the home of apollo the priests of dionysus were formally admitted with their train of ceremony and festival so in the life of the race and in the minds of the greeks themselves the reconciliation took place henceforth greek culture was the child of both dionysus and apollo and in the tragic mysteries was revealed to the spectator an image of the life of the world 
on the stage he beheld dionysus and the dionysified struggling against the apollon powers of fate and death the greek needed to behold that struggle he needed to be constantly reassured that life was of this nature profoundly as he might and must sympathize with the sufferings of apollo he could not but sympathize even more deeply with the agonies of dionysus yet in the end he could not be mortally distressed for he felt that fierce and terrible as the conflict was real and moving as the pains of the tragedy must needs be it was the game the play the celestial life of gods that he was witnessing to rise to the height where he might joyfully behold the game without ceasing for an instant to feel the pain and sorrow of it all to rejoice with dionysus victorious and yet to mourn with apollo slain to assist in his own life the great drama by welcoming all that promised struggle finally to will with all his soul the increasing triumph of dionysus that life and joy might be all in all such was the meaning of tragedy among the greeks when nietzsche had reached this conclusion he turned to the closer examination of his own europe in the music of tristan and isolde he heard or thought he heard the old dionysian strains he believed that europe was about to enter through wagner into a repetition of the spiritual history of the greeks dionysus he thought had come to europe and if the events in greece were to be repeated in europe we were already on the threshold of the new era with dionysus at our gates in the spirit of joy freedom excess the spirit of pure energy the old cry of life desiring to renew itself how could a chosen disciple of dionysus be silent nietzsche threw himself into the struggle even as he believed dionysus the spirit of life itself had already done for was not dionysus the spirit of the years to come yearning to mix himself with life later he regretted having mistaken wagner for a genuine dionysian and reflected that the dionysian swans of his enthusiasm were no more than geese but he never doubted that the history of the greeks was about to be repeated failing wagner he himself would be the dionysian initiator he would transform europe and deliver men's minds from the dull oppression of apollo he began from that time the enormous labor of turning the dionysian criticism on the whole fabric of european civilization if he is so largely negative in his effects the cause is not to be sought so much in him as in the times positive doctrines he had in abundance later in life he deplored the negations into which he had been led but the work of undermining the foundations of modern thought occupied too large a part of a comparatively brief life hence we see in his work more of the struggle and less of the triumph of dionysus even in this it is greek history repeated for dionysus also was defeated at first end of frederick nietzsche's apollo or dionysus from frederick nietzsche the dionysian spirit of the age by alfred richard orridge 1873 to 1934 published in 1906